Okay. Um, I think I might need a little volume up here. I can also just project. I'm from New Jersey. I'm capable of being very loud. There you go. Organically. What? I'm from Minnesota, so I'm going to need... Uh, oh. Um, oh. Oh. All right, uh, so hi everyone, uh, and welcome to the Right to Repair update. Uh, thank you for coming for your 7 p.m. panel time slot to talk about these very sexy topics. Um, my name is Meredith Rose. I'm Senior Policy Counsel at a group called Public Knowledge. We are a Washington, D.C.-based uh, consumer advocacy organization, and we work on a wide range of tech issues. So we work on everything from net neutrality to intellectual property policy to right to repair to privacy to antitrust to you name it. We're probably, we're, we're probably magpieing it on some level. Yep. Um, and I'm Haley Tsukayama. I am Associate Director of Legislative Activism at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF. Like, uh, like PK, we do a lot of issues, um, a lot. Uh, many of the same ones that Meredith mentioned, including right to repair. Um, at EFF, I focus on state legislation. Um, and as you'll hear in this panel, there's been a lot of movement in the states on right to repair this year and in the past couple of years. So that's what I'm here to talk about. But I think first, Meredith, mm. could you? Really? <laughs> you can tell. You're going to get NPR act. really quick. <laughs> Haley. Could you um, tell these fine folks just a little bit about what the right to repair is and why it matters? I would love to. Thank you. Uh, so the right to repair. Uh, show of hands, who here has been to a talk or panel or engaged on right to repair issues before? Okay, so a couple folks. Uh, who here has absolutely no idea what we mean when we say right to repair? No shame. Absolutely no judgment. Feel free to put your hands up. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, thank you for your honesty. Uh, it's always good to be able to gauge sort of how much people know about this going into a panel. Uh, so, yeah, so the right to repair uh, is a thing that it feels kind of silly that we need to have a name for it. Uh, because historically, when you own a thing, if it breaks, you have the ability to fix it. Uh, you know, or if you don't want to fix it yourself, to take it down to someone who can fix it. Uh, and things have started to get a little weird uh, and ahistorical in the last couple of decades. Now, when we talk about right to repair, there are a lot of different aspects to right to repair. It's a very big umbrella term, um, and Haley's going to talk about some of the things that go on on the state level that have addressed various permutations of right to repair. So when we talk about right to repair, we talk about a handful of things. We talk about things like uh, making... Uh, interface software available to repair technicians. We may we talk about uh, mandating that repair manuals are available to technicians and to end consumers, uh, all the way down to mandating interoperable repair parts uh, and making those available. All the way to, on the other end, uh, France just passed a repairability score law in the last, I believe, year, 18 months, mm -hmm. um, where they basically have to put the equivalent of a nutrition label on consumer devices saying, how easy is this to repair? I think it's on a 1 to 10 scale. Uh, all the way down to what I'm going to talk about a little bit more, which is copyright law. Uh, and you can imagine me saying that in the grimmest possible tone. So one of the hiccups uh, of the last few decades uh, is that... Software is in absolutely everything nowadays. Uh, this was, for those of us who remember the before times, it was not always this way. Um, now, back in 1998, Congress passed and the president signed the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. Uh, the DMCA did a lot of things, some of which folks are going to be more sort of reflexively familiar with than others. Among other things, it implemented the notice and takedown procedure that many of us are familiar with uh, against our will uh, on internet uh, content that contains copyrighted material. Uh, but one of the other things that it did was it uh, contained a section, which is section 1201, which you will hear me name check several times. And section 1201 was a provision uh, that was struck as part of a balance between what were then sort of nascent internet platforms. You know, this was 1998. Google was not the Google of today. Um, Facebook didn't exist yet. I think Google was did exist, but was very, very young. Uh, Yahoo was kind of the big name at the time, so that tells you how far we've come. Uh, and it was this balance that was, that was struck between the two of them. And part of that balance was Section 1201. And Section 1201 was designed with the intention of allowing... Um, traditional content companies like music industry, movie industry, uh, literary publishing, to create a market for digital versions of their works. And so what 1201 does is it says, all right, 
if you have a copyrighted piece of content, and that content is surrounded by a digital lock, which is referred to in the statute as a technical protection measure, or TPM. Uh, you may also hear me use the term digital rights management, or DRM. If I switch between the two, I apologize. I try to, for the non-lawyers, just keep one acronym, but they are functionally interchangeable for this purpose. Um, if it is surrounded by this digital lock, then it is a separate offense to bypass that lock. If you bypass that lock to get at the underlying copyrighted work, we don't care what you do with it. You could bypass that lock and just observe that there is a copyrighted piece of content down there. You could perceive the copyrighted content. You could watch the copyrighted content. You could make a fair use of the copyrighted content. You could do all kinds of legally permissible things with the copyrighted content. The law does not care. The fact that you have bypassed that lock is a separate offense. Uh, now, Congress, to its credit, uh, which is not a phrase you will hear me say very often, <laughs> uh, did think this might get out of hand. Uh, and so in an attempt to future-proof the law, they said, all right, we're going to do, we're going to have a system. And the system is going to be that every three years, the U.S. Copyright Office, which exists within the Library of Congress, so you can already see this is going to get fun, um, is going to have hearings, basically. And if folks say, well, I need to be able to bypass these locks for a lawful purpose, and these locks are impeding my ability to exercise my rights, um, folks can go to the Copyright Office and petition them for an exemption from this law. And so the first round of these, I believe, would have been in uh, da, 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 probably 2000, I think was the first go around. Um, and, you know, one of the first exemptions that was granted was an exemption that granted folks permission to bypass these digital locks so that blind people can use ebook readers, screen readers for ebooks. That was one of the very first ones that happened. That has been standing and has been renewed ever since. But every three years, we all have to show up hat in hand yet again uh, and say, actually, we still need these exemptions uh, that were granted to us. Uh, please don't throw them away. <laughs> so that's the 1201 process. Um, the, re the way this intersects with right to repair is that the, the rule around not circumventing a digital lock to access underlying copyrighted work applies to all copyrighted work, which includes software. And now that we have software in absolutely everything, functionally, I think this picture might be exempt, um, to fix a thing, there is a better than even chance you have to bypass a lock in order to interact with the software that exists in said thing in order to fix it. Um, show of hands, who owns or has driven a car made after about 2010? Okay, congratulations, you've driven a computer that has wheels on it. Um, if you have to get it uh, serviced, show of hands, who has to go to an authorized dealer to get their car serviced? I hate it. Um, and that is in no small part because the only folks, in many cases, who have the official keys that let them get into the software that is on your computer is the dealership. So if you have a Subaru, got to go to the Subaru dealership. If you have a BMW, got to go to the BMW dealership. Uh, and so you can see how this creates a bottleneck, basically. Um, what a lot of manufacturers have done is they have used Section 1201 to preclude other people from accessing their software, which precludes aftermarket repair. So it starts to shut out third-party repair services and lets these companies monopolize downstream repair, which becomes a very lucrative market for most of them. Um, you know, you can't legally, until very recently, uh, you could not legally fix the uh, optical drive in your Xbox because of this. Um, your optical drive in your Xbox breaks. It's very easy to, it's, it's, you can get a $12 replacement on Amazon. But you could not legally do it because you had to circumvent the little digital lock that paired it to the motherboard. Um, so we see this cropping up in all different kinds of ways. And because it, again, I harp on the copyright law part of right to rip it because I'm a copyright lawyer and this gives me heartburn personally. <laughs> Um, but it does intersect with a lot of other things going on, which is the point at which I'm going to hand it off to Haley and talk about uh, all the fun and exciting things that are happening on the state level, right, to repair movements. Yeah, so happy to tell. Thank you for that, uh, for that scene setting. Yeah, so I mean, I think um, Meredith gave a very good explanation of, of sort of what's happening. Um, a lot of what I have to do in my advocacy work is talk about why you as an individual should care. So, um, you know, w when we're looking at, um, so this, all of this, right? Um, not you, of course, the things you talked about. All this mess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, has prompted a lot of advocacy because a lot of people are like, wait, I own a thing and I can't tinker with it? That's insane, um, which, you know, it is. Um, and so uh, this has affected a lot of different populations. So, of course, there's, you know, everybody who owns a thing and, like, I'm clumsy as anything and my screen is always in danger of being cracked. Um, and, like, maybe I can't get to an Apple store. Maybe there isn't an Apple store within... 20 miles of me, within 50 miles of me, within 100 miles of me. What am I supposed to do? Um, it also affects uh, a lot of people like um, like farmers, who uh, John Deere is a very strong um, opponent of the right to repair. But, you know, if you have a tractor that has software and it breaks down in the field and you need to get it, you, know, you need to get it working, there's not like a lot of time for you to like call the guy and like have him come in and fix the thing. Um, you used to be able to just do it yourself or find someone that you trusted um, to do it. And so um, we've had a long, really, I think, decades now, I think you can say, of advocacy of people just saying, like, this is not right. Um, and as often happens with policy, uh, you say the same thing over and over and over again. And then for some reason, one day, it gets through. And um, that has been happening more and more often in the states. And particularly this year, we passed some really exciting legislation. Um, some of it is like specific to certain kinds of devices. Well, all of it is specific to certain kinds of devices, but um, some are more narrow than others. So in Colorado, for example, they passed a great law um, around wheelchair repair, right? So people who have electronic wheelchairs, they uh, the parts break, you know, you're really out of luck, right? You can't go anywhere, and you have to like wait however long it takes for them to get someone out to you um, to get the repair. So Colorado passed a right to repair law for wheelchairs. Um, Massachusetts has an existing uh, right to repair law for for autos, cars, cars. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it is in litigation right now. Yep. But, um, but you know, so that, that's another um, area. And then we've had some good, um, in New York this year, they passed really a more general, um, a more general right to repair uh, f uh, law. I, when they switch from build to law, I get, I get stuck. Um, but when they have right to repair law, um, that looks at a lot of consumer electronics. Um, you know, there, that was the subject of some pretty heavy lobbying as well from the opposition. So slowly they've had to cut pieces out of it. So no agricultural equipment in that one. Um, no appliances in that one, I believe. Um, and uh, not as, uh, not applied to, like, um, like if Google sells a bunch of Chromebooks to a school district, um, that is actually a really important, I think, use of right to repair. Because, of course, if you have a fleet of, like, 200 Chromebooks that you have deployed to your students, you know, I mean... I'm clumsy, uh, as I said. <laughs> Students also can tend to be clumsy or careless, or you know they have heavy backpacks or whatever, um, and they can't repair those on site. So, um, but New York cut that out of that law. So New York looked pretty good right up until the end. It got a lot of last minute lobbying. It's still a good law, but it it got a little weaker. And then, this is like. I'm really excited. My home state of Minnesota passed a very good right to repair law. Um, <laughs> and uh, it also covers uh, consumer electronics. There's still some carve outs out of there. Ag is, is a really difficult one, I think, that, that people are coming up on um, a lot. And Minnesota, of course, is, a, is an agricultural state. Um, but it was a very good landmark law. And then um, California is currently in session, and on Friday I did a little dance at the EFF table because uh, the California bill, um, which is about as strong as the Minnesota bill, um, made it through a key committee and is now going for a floor vote. So we have two, wait, one vote left, and then to the governor. And I think um, California is going to pass a pretty strong bill. So it's like years and years and years and years of just saying like this is a problem and uh we finally i guess educated enough people and i say we eff has been involved in this pk has been involved in this uh the u.s uh, public interest research group uh i fix it which sells parts um to people for their phones um, and other electronics um repair coalition so a lot a lot a lot of folks um and we're like really coming up i think on 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 good um on a good run and hopefully uh, you know as we've seen bills get duplicated in other states uh i'm hoping that we'll see the california bill and the minnesota bill get introduced in other states as well so yep. It's rare that I get to say we're winning, but on this one, we're winning. For once. <laughs> um, so that's a good cue to talk about the federal side. So so to zoom out a little bit, when we talk about right to repair, you know, I mentioned at top that there are a lot of different flavors of right to repair. 
that exists. There's a lot of different ways you can tackle this problem of folks cannot get independent, fast, affordable repair of their stuff. Um, and this stuff, by the way, includes cars. Um, independent auto repair shops have really been pushing um, for right to repair laws. There's a lot of ways you can tackle it. You can tackle the copyright problem, which I think everyone should tackle because that is my problem. Um, there are things called design patents, which are patents. You think about a patent, it protects an invention, a new widget, a new way of doing something. Design patents are not that. Design patents are an abomination. Um, a side over. Uh, design patents protect the way that something is designed, its shape, its appearance. So um, show of hands, who owns a MacBook? A Mac or Apple laptop. Have you ever flipped over and looked at the screws on the bottom of that? The little square peg screws? Those are design patented. Um, and that is how Apple prevents anybody from selling uh, little Allen wrenches that'll unscrew their MacBook, is because they have a patent on the screws. Uh, yeah, it's all this kind of stuff. Um, what's that? Yep. It's a mess. Um, so there's a lot of different kind of angles of attack on this. Um, and the other question when you're talking about right to repair laws is how big do you want to make the universe of things that are covered by this right to repair law? So like Haley mentioned, um, all right to repair laws cover some delimited universe of devices. And how big or small that universe is is going to depend on how you structure the law. One of the things that we see a lot in right to repair discussions uh, is folks immediately go to health and safety concerns. So one of the uh, one of the classes of exemption that has come up in this this every three years the triennial exemption process that the copyright office runs. One of the exemptions that currently exists uh, is for access to medical devices. So it's access for folks to fix their own medical devices. Uh, my friend and former colleague, Raza, uh, type 1 diabetic, uh, he calls it his bionic pancreas. He has got an insulin pump attached literally at the hip. Uh, if that breaks, that's a problem for him. Um, now, he is a pretty competent guy. He feels comfortable fixing it himself. Um, he feels comfortable circumventing uh, the locks on it in order to access the underlying data of the readouts of his blood sugar. So he has hacked his pancreas. He's very proud of this. <laughs> um, and those are standing exemptions. Medical device manufacturers, not a fan of this. Um, you know, partly because they raise health and safety concerns. Uh, in reality, it's because the repair market is extremely lucrative. Um, if you've ever worked in a hospital and you had to get an MRI machine repaired, you, you, it's a, that is many, many dollar signs to get one of those fixed. There are very few people that can do that. Um, and... So how you structure that universe of things that is eligible for a right to repair is a constant back and forth. Now, agricultural equipment is, is great for a bunch of reasons. One, because it is kind of fundamentally absurd uh, when you have people arguing against it for tractors. Uh, back in 2015 was the first time that this came up in the Copyright Office proceedings. Um, and things generally tend to go, th the first time you'll see a right to repair move, like any inroads being made, tends to be through this every three years process and then you've got three years of like no real problems cropping up now you have a proof of concept that a right to repair is not a big deal for this um and so in 2015 uh folks came up asking for agricultural equipment repair this led to a situation where you had the idaho potato farmers association at the copyright office saying well, if our tractors break down we lose a crop like this is not a question of we'd have to pay too much this is literally our crops will rot in the ground if we have to wait too long to get this fixed and then we had the john deere representative who i'm sure was not being paid enough whatever he was being paid <laughs> who showed up and argued with a very straight face that if we allowed people to circumvent the digital locks on their tractors then they could pirate music in the fields um the real problem let's be honest you know, to which I was like, well, now we can. Um, <laughs> thanks for the idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's it's a very, you know, again, it, that's exactly the reaction I think the Copyright Office had, um, albeit a little more subdued because they sort of had to be. Um, but you see these arguments pop up again and again. Um, you know, there's, there's always the specter of like, well, what if someone tries to fix a computer on a Boeing 747 and then the plane falls out of the sky? Uh, to which the response is, there's still aviation safety laws. You know this, right? <laughs> like, uh, people have been independently repairing cars 
as long as cars have existed. And we still have auto safety standards. Um, if there is a repair that is done wrong and breaks a fundamental safety feature, we have a legal regime to deal with that already. So all of this is background context to say uh, federal right to repair laws. They are starting to move, which is very exciting. Last Congress, there was a bill, I believe it was called the Freedom to Repair Act, which was introduced by Representative Mondaire Jones uh, and Representative uh, Deborah Sparks, I believe. So it was bipartisan bill, one Democrat, one Republican. Everybody was holding hands and kumbayaing about this. It was great. Didn't go anywhere, um, <laughs> as our best hopes often do. Uh, it is an uphill fight. Um, so that bill didn't get a whole lot of traction. There uh, recently, in I believe in July, was a hearing out of the House Judiciary Committee. Proof that this was a bipartisan issue. Um, Representative Issa, who is the chair, who is Republican, he's the chair of the uh, House IP Subcommittee on Judiciary, had a whole right to repair hearing about this. Uh, and he came in and, you know, like I said, there's a lot of different ways to attack right to repair and each congress critter sort of has their own preferred flavor of right to repair that they want to go at and i am constantly waving the flag for the copyright fix uh representative isa was really into design patents this whole like you can't patent the square screwed nonsense which is a very 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 big issue in auto repair parts mm -hmm. um design patents for auto parts is a huge huge bottleneck for right to repair and so he has a right to repair bill called the smart act um, not to be confused, there's also a SMART Act for copyright law. God help me. They're too close to each other. <laughs> there are only so many acronyms in the world, Mary. Ugh, they need to get better. Um, so he has this. Uh, he has a design patent for auto parts bill, specifically targeted to right to repair. And he said, you know, like, we'll give some airtime to this copyright stuff, whatever. You know, please just be happy and leave us alone about this. Um, it was a panel, and there were five witnesses. Four of them were right to repair advocates. Uh, not a single one of them was a manufacturer. Uh, and the one guy who did come in and speak against right to repair was basically like an academic. I don't actually know what Devlin does nowadays, but uh, he, he showed up and he sort of made his case. And by the end of it, you could watch all the members of the committee be radicalized in real time about how we need to f fix copyright law. Um, by the end of it, ISA was going, doesn't this seem a little absurd that copyright law prevents this? And you could hear me cheering from the back of the room. Like, I was just, you know, slam dunk. Um, and it was, and I, you know, I have done copyright advocacy for about just shy of a decade at this point, and I will say unequivocally, that was the most reform-friendly hearing I have ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, ever. Like, not even just on right to bear, on any issue I work on, which is a sad state about the kinds of stuff I work on. Um, but it, there really was a almost uniform agreement that like, oh no, this is ridiculous. Like we did not, you had Zoe Lofgren who was there in 1998 when they drafted the DMCA going, yeah, we didn't mean for this to happen. Um, so there is a lot of buzz right now in Congress about pushing an actual permanent fix on the copyright side specifically. Um, it is not going to be a total solution. It is not going to completely grant a full big right to repair. There's still things like design patents. There's things like accessibility of um, repair manuals, uh, all other kinds of stuff. But it is a very, very big first step. Um, if you have followed iFixit recently, uh, they just released, uh, we are working with them because we, in conjunction with our push in Congress, are working on Yet again, we're at the every three years triennial proceeding at the Copyright Office. Every copyright lawyer's Groundhog Day. We, we, <laughs> I see the same people every, and it's, it's because it's a government proceeding, it takes about 18 months. So it's about 18 months on, 18 months off, functionally, for th every three-year cycle. Um, and we asked them to expand the repair exemption so that it will also cover industrial equipment. Um, and if you follow iFixit, you may have seen that they posted a big announcement about this when we filed it last Friday, uh, not this past Friday, a week beforehand. Um, and one of the things that they have done is they, uh, you may be familiar with the constant saga of the broken soft serve machines at McDonald's. <laughs> well, Kyle Wines, the CEO of iFixit, absolute madman, went out and bought himself one. He just straight up bought a Taylor Soft Surf machine and said, we're going to figure out how to, we're going to do a teardown. We're going to figure out how this thing works. We're going to figure out exactly what we need to do to fix it. We're going to figure out exactly why we're not 
apparently allowed to fix it. So they released an entire video doing a breakdown showing all of the weak points in the system. Um, and, you know, the, all the frustration when all of a sudden they were getting sludge out of it instead of ice cream. It's a very fun, uh, very fun video. And so we are going to be advocating for the right to repair McDonald's soft serve machines at the U.S. Copyright Office, uh, <laughs> which is officially the most fun thing I've ever had to advocate for. And we'll make for better summers. I think yes, and he, and he owes me a grimace shake when this is over. I have told him this. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you know, it, it's kind of, it can be fun. Uh, this is occasionally public interest advocacy on tech stuff can be a thankless job. Uh, and once in a while you get to do something really cool and fun. And I think this falls under the cool and fun bucket. So, um, it is always great to be able to, to ring bells about how much, how much you can do here. Yeah. I think another important point to raise is that, you know, we've talked about kind of uh, individual people and we've talked about legislators. You know, the companies obviously have been, they, they've been very vocal on this issue. A lot of them don't like it. But um, I think seeing where the wind is blowing, we have seen some um, important changes in company policy as well. Now, I'm of the opinion that it's great if a company, you know, agrees to uh, support the right to repair, but company policy can change at any moment. So that's why I still want to see legislation. But um, so Apple will out. Apple had been a huge uh, opponent of right to repair. Even in the New York law, they wrote a, a pretty strong uh, opposition letter. Um, and they have come out with some right to repair or, or some um, some programs to let people have uh, to have Apple send them parts for, for various um, devices. Um, Microsoft has said that it supports the right to repair. Um, and, uh, you know, so these are really, these are big changes. Uh, it's a real difference um, in, in the way that the advocacy conversation has gone. Apple is actually supporting the California bill, um, which was a huge moment for, um, for that bill in particular, because of course, uh, California is Apple's home turf, and the legislature cares quite a bit what the tech industry <laughs> thinks about legislation in that state. Um, and so, you know, I think, um, it's, it's really interesting to kind of see how all the advocacy, and I really credit the advocacy and, and the individual people on the ground who've been pushing for these <laughs> policies forever. <laughs> Haley and I were both on a call, like literally the day that Apple announced they were actually going to support the California law, and somebody had to jump in and be like, okay, no, I know what you're all thinking. One, we're, you're not being pranked. Um, two, this does not mean that the California law sucks. Uh, because our initial assumption was, well, if Apple's supporting it, this has got to be like a bad, like, no, no, it's still good. Like, yeah. they haven't gutted it. They actually legitimately just did an about face on it, yep. um, <laughs> which just proves how inevitable they see this as being yeah. at this point. I admit I did email the author when I, when I saw Apple was supporting it, and I was like, did, did you take any amendments that we don't know about? <laughs> <laughs> What's no! the text? <laughs> Yeah, so it is it is pretty wild. Um, yeah, and we're seeing a lot of movement in here. Um, and it's, you know, it's a good time to be a repair advocate. Um, and for folks who are interested in how you can get involved in this, call your Congress critter. Uh, it is difficult to overstate how important it is for uh, members of Congress when they start getting rumbling from their constituents about, especially, especially about an issue that they may not be tuned into yet. If they start getting waves of calls saying, we support the right to repair, they will then turn to their staffer and go, tell me about this right to repair thing. And then those staffers will turn around and talk to other staffers and say, do you know about this right to repair thing? And then eventually staffers will start calling us and then we'll get to tell them about the right to repair. Um, and the same is true at the state level. Oh, yes. So uh, it's a great time. It's a good time to be alive. This is like one of the few very happy panel topics I get to talk about. <laughs> There's a lot of doom and gloom in tech policy. This is not one of them. Um, but uh, I did want to like open it up to questions because we got a pretty good sized group here, um, and this is a topic that often uh, raises a lot of thoughts and opinions. Howdy. Hello. Um, I'm curious. Do you think that it's usually productive to uh, attempt to pressure companies to have them uh, not stand in the way of legislature like this, either as a sh uh, as a potentially as a shareholder? or just as a regular old customer? And if so, what do you think the best ways to, to do these things are? Yeah, so I mean, I think we have, in this particular case, we've seen company advocacy be really effective. Um, the Microsoft uh, statement that I mentioned, that was really as a result of uh, activism to shareholders, right? To have, uh, at the shareholders meeting, to have it come up and be a proposal. Um, there are a lot of groups, you know, I. Rep I represent one of them, the EFF, which is a member-supported organization um, that really does try and um, and talk to companies as well as, as legislatures about some of these issues. Um, you know, I think it's, 
a, 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 honestly, a customer service email never goes amiss. Um, you know, just really just letting people know the thing that companies care about is is profit, right? And and are people still going to use their products? What are the things that are going to stop people from using their products? So it really is, I think, an area where like voting with your feet um, and being vocal about it is important. Um, and then you know, finding other groups to to get together and amplify. I really think we would not be where we are with right to prepare, for example, if farmers hadn't stepped up mm -hmm. and said, you know, look, this is really important to us. If people in um, communities, in rural communities, right, who don't have access to um, to all kinds of repair, um, didn't step up, um, I think it's a very personal issue, right? There are a lot of personal stories, and I think um, really making that clear to companies is important. And I will say it's always fun to be able to work with farmers on something because when farmers get frothy, farmers get results. Um, <laughs> farmers are a, a almost ludicrously powerful lobby in the United States. And as a not ludicrously powerful consumer interest lobby, I love to ride those coattails when I can. Um, but no, and it's, you know, and some, some companies, and I think, um, you know, there are many companies who have historically and throughout their product design prioritized right to repair and i think they don't message it as much which you know i think they should message it more um steam uh or valve actually has consistently come at things from a right to repair so like the steam deck is designed specifically to be repairable at home mm -hmm. they worked in collaboration with iFixit to design it to make sure that it was fixable at home with easy off-the-shelf parts um and that is part of their company culture you know valve came up as a bunch of modders like originally and that's that is where they come from they've always approached it that way um and so there are alternatives out there you know i can talk about this forever i still own you you can see two apple products up here on my left um apple not usually the greatest actor on right to repair putting it mildly um but you know also just voting with your dollars when you can if you've got a choice between something that is easy to fix and something that is not go with the thing that you can get fixed and then tell people about it Hi, I was wondering from a uh, like federal versus state law level, um, what produces more impact in terms of me being able to buy parts and diagnostic software and things like that. Once they once a law passes in one state, does that then force the manufacturer to have to provide the parts, or does it have to be the state that manufacturer is based in, or do we have to have a federal law for them to then release parts and diagnostics and schematics and things like that? Uh, also, shout out to uh, Rossman Group, uh, Lewis Rossman on YouTube, who I think has done a huge uh, yes. thing on YouTube, making me and several others aware of this issue over the years. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. For sure. Well, this is sort of a philosophical question, but... Mm. Yeah, so there's a couple of different um, aspects to it. I think we have not seen the, like... So things like you must make repair, like replacement parts available, I don't know that we've actually seen that instantiated all the way through to the end yet. Um... I will say that one of the differences and one of the reason, again, I'm going to beat the drum for like federal copyright stuff. Um, I talked about section 1201 and the thou shalt not break digital locks part of the law. Section 1202, the very next section in the law, um, separately from all of this makes it an offense to sell or otherwise traffic in any device which will allow you to circumvent the lock. That is a separate provision of law obnoxiously. Um, and the, the end result of that is when you get an exemption through this process at the Copyright Office, even if you win the exemption, you can't traffic in the tools that'll let you actually do the exemption you're now legally allowed to do. So you have to homebrew it. Um, and this is obnoxious for many reasons. One, it's just a like fundamentally Kafka-esque part of our, our copyright system. Um, two, it leads to some kind of wild results. Um, so, for example, back around 2018-ish, I want to say, um, drones were just becoming like the hot new hobby, and they were all anybody in D.C. wanted to talk about, because, uh, you know, a lot of, there was a drone that like flew over the Capitol build. There was all kinds of like very embarrassing, um, oh no, drone in our airspace kind of things. Uh, drone manufacturers were understandably very afraid of being regulated, and so what they did was they started baking in geofencing into their software. Um, and so geofencing, for folks who aren't familiar with it, is essentially in the software, they, you know, there's a GPS baked into the drone, and they said, look, do not fly over this zone. And there are FAA-designated zones that are legally, they are required to not fly over, so they baked those in. But they said, you know, if we really want to avoid being regulated, we want to buy some goodwill. So we're just going to expand the borders of that. And so they baked in an extra buffer zone that was not required by law. 
It was just their attempt to get on the good side of Congress and regulators. Um, the end result is you cannot fly a drone anywhere within 30 miles of the District of Columbia. Um, and there are enormous snow fly zones all over the country, especially up and down the East Coast. Uh, basically, if you're within like 50 miles of a military base, forget it. You just you don't don't buy a drone. You're going to be dumping your money out. Um, drone hobbyists uh, understandably found this very annoying. And so they decided they were going to hack their drones. <laughs> um, and they were going to hack it so that they would ignore the voluntary extra geofencing. Um, but there's no legal white market for the tools to do this. And so most of the tools that they got were gray market tools from Russia, um, which they had installed on their drones. And so a huge swath of the civilian drone market has a lot of questionable Russian software floating around on it. Um, this creates all kinds of secondary problems. Uh, and so the lack of an official sanctioned legal market for these tools produces a black market, which produces a whole nother set of problems. Um, and so thankfully, one of the sets of discussions that is happening at the federal level right now is to repeal that truly stupid portion of the law and just allow there to be a market in the tools that will allow you to circumvent so long as you are doing the circumventing for legal purposes. Uh, you know, you can own things for all kinds of legal purposes and you can do illegal stuff with them. You know, we still let you own them for legal purposes. So. Um, to supplement that, I would say, so the question of like state versus federal, mm -hmm. state legislatures often move more quickly. Not always, but uh, they often move more quickly. There's fewer people um they're they're representing fewer people so um what can be nice about state legislation um you know i reeled off a number of states that have this legislation it puts pressure on things it does put pressure on companies companies could elect to say sure we'll roll this out more broadly um even if it isn't in in your particular state so um i think they go they go hand in hand really in my opinion now there are some things that state laws can't fix, the copyright being the main one. Um, but certainly if you're saying, you know, distributing parts, uh, having companies distribute parts and tools, um, that is something that you can do at the state level. So it's, it's, all, it's all good. It's all together. Do you have a question, oh, yeah. Chuck? I do. Uh, partly, kind of, I just want to go forward with what you were talking about. I do know that there are people here in Georgia, in the Georgia legislature, that have kind of really stepped back up there there's some interest in doing right to repair here for anybody that's in the audience in Georgia that is a stakeholder here um, and the other point about that is that I know from in the middle of the pandemic when I was doing some research and getting to know like who might be one of the people that Electronic Frontiers Georgia would approach um, they are going the path of agriculture like they're mm -hmm. the people that have been in charge historically of the agriculture committee here in the House and Senate those would be our some of the people we would go to so if you have anything to add as to strategies for not only for the people living in Georgia here that might want to reach out to their um, legislators but also just from the standpoint of like that's the path that, um, meaning like uh well we have a committee that would be agricultural base where they would you know put it in to try to get it passed on to a floor vote mm -hmm. that's the process so uh you shouldn't limit yourself to thinking that agriculture uh, or farm equipment would be the only way but maybe you have some other advice to add into like how are we going to talk to people about i want to work on my car um even though i know you're going to be looking at farm bill type mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. farm equipment's a great, great uh, gateway drug for right to repair um, for legislators. Uh, yeah, no, I think, again, it's it's part of that, like, you know, how big of the universe are we going to draw around the right to repair question is it, it's so there's sort of two parts to it. One is who is the most sympathetic first case mm -hmm. and first mover? Um, and farmers are often it. Um they're also, the second part is, they're a good test case. Uh, and so these health and safety concerns, which are, you know, I understand them. Like, I, I get the, the worries about, like, well, you're just going to let everybody hack the tractors. What if the tractors catch on fire? Okay. They won't, but okay. Like, I understand where that's coming from. Um, part of the way that this has been so incremental is because these little exemptions have worked, and they've been fine and they've been test cases, and then we just make them slightly bigger, and then that ends up being fine. And then we make them a little bit bigger, still fine. Um, and so it starts to snowball a little bit. Um, autos have the added benefit of uh, 
just within recent generational memory, like everyone's got an uncle who works on a Corvette in their garage. Like this is a proud American tradition. We've all got one. Um, and if you tell him like, oh yeah, how do you feel about the computers and the cars nowadays? Thanksgiving dinner, you get the 20 minute spiel. Um, and so I think it is, you know, those two devices have like very compelling narratives around them. Your phone screen has another one just because everyone's dealt with a cracked phone screen at some point. Um, and there's all kinds of shenanigans you can point to, specifically with Apple and how they have tried to, uh, you know, lock, um, you know, a specific piece of glass to your, you know, so that like if you try to replace the one piece of glass and you're not an Apple technician, it will brick the phone. This was a thing they actually did for a little while. Yep. Um, you know, and there's all kinds of bad behavior and shenanigans about it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it is it is important to start, you know, never lose sight of the big goal, but I think it is important to start humble because I think incrementalism on this stuff, as frustrating as it is, and I say this as someone who's been doing this for almost a decade, it is deeply frustrating, um, it is still actually getting stuff done and still getting stuff done on a timeline that is way faster than a lot of issues. Yeah. Um, taking nearly a decade to get from there to here is actually extremely impressive. Yeah. And to piggyback on that, I mean, I think in terms of framing around the advocacy, the thing that we found really useful is is individual stories, right? So just coming up and being like, this thing broke, I couldn't do this thing. I mean, you know, if you look at, again, like the wheelchair repair folks, like in Colorado, they did, they did amazing <coughs> advocacy just organizing that community. And I think at the core of, of when I think about right to repair, at the core of this issue is user autonomy, right? It's like, this is my thing and I should be able to, to, to work with it. Um, and I do find that that, that that resonates. And so whether that's being the guy under your car covered in grease or whether that, or gal, sorry, guy or gal under your car covered in grease or actually a person, let's just say person. <laughs> yep, there we go. In grease. The individual covered in grease. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, or the farmer in the field or, you know, whatever. Um, I do, I do think those personal stories, it's ultimately a very personal issue because these are things that you really rely on in your everyday life. Um, and so that's really what I found to be the most effective framing. Yep. So this is just more sort of me being curious. And I know this is like a very broad question, but, um, it seems like, you know, of course there's always tons of stuff in the news and, um, you know, when it comes to the, the to technology in general and the tech industry and all that, like, there are a ton of different issues. There are lots of different, you know, things that probably need to be addressed. Um, so, you know, how does EFF, uh, you know, or the organizations um, that you're a part of sort of go about just even, I mean, I know you guys have your specialty areas, but, like, keep up with all these different issues and be able to even you know, advocate or, or, or pick and choose, you know, which ones you want to really like, okay, you know, we're going to focus in at least on, you know, these two things, you know, for this session or, or whatnot. Um, and sort of just avoid burnout too from just all the constant that, that, that hits stuff. Home. Um, yeah, not very effectively is the answer. Uh, <laughs> No, we're magpies. Uh, just a, astounding amount of ADHD in our office. Um, we all see something shiny and we're like, oh, we're going to work on that. Um, no, we, you do have to like, you have to pick and choose. That is completely correct. And burnout is a, is a very real problem in public interest advocacy. Um, a lot of it is just dictated by where we're already experts and where we feel like we have something to say. Um, one of the great things about working in public interest advocacy is there's a very broad community and everybody kind of comes at it from a slightly different flavor. Um, and so sometimes, often, there are issues that we care about, but we simply don't have the bandwidth or the expertise to be able to add anything particularly unique. And that is when we turn to our friends who we know do have that expertise um, and say, hey, are you filing comments in this uh in this proceeding, EFF, um, or hi, Center for Democracy and Technology, or hi, Leadership Forum, or hi, Future of Privacy Forum. What are you guys doing on this? Um, and so it's very common. Um, if you're lawyers, you're probably very used to seeing amicus briefs that have like, you know, five to 10 to 20 co-signers on them. That is a thing that we do a lot. Um, so there's a lot of distributed labor on this stuff. Sometimes you just have to find a friend to hold the pen. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, you constantly have to find a balance of responding to bad stuff that needs to be responded mm -hmm. to, 
pushing forward where you see that there's momentum to maybe actually get something over the finish line, and also initiating new advocacy work that you're building from the ground up. And trying to keep all those three things in balance is just, it's just something you have to figure out how to do. Yeah, and I mean, so practically, spreadsheets is how I track it. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I mean, as Meredith said, it, you know, you really just kind of have to say, okay, how long have we been having this conversation in this state? You know, what are term limits? You know, you really have to think about a lot of things, the political landscape, the um, the policy landscape, what are other states doing? What kind of examples can you bring? Um, and that's, you know, in the strategy setting, that's really sort of where where can we as an organization with our voice and our expertise do the most good? Um, and that is really what we have to think about. And burnout is hard, right? There are a lot of issues right now that I'm like, oh, I would really love to be working on that. And you just have to say, okay, how close am I to this finish line? What is it going to take to push me over? Like, how do I um, how do I work with that? And then, you know, f especially for state legislation, like for us working with like Ele Electronic Frontiers Georgia, um, groups on the ground in, in all these states is hugely, hugely important um, for us because you all are going to know more about what's going on in your state legislation than I ever will um, and so uh, yeah finding it, it, finding friends the, the the real prize is the friends you make along the way when you're talking about <laughs> advocacy the, uh, well, and the other thing and, and just you know and I, I know we're coming up on time yeah. um, and we got actually we got about 10 minutes it's better than I expected um, I will say that um, uh, one of the trickier things is to be able to make a judgment call about when something is ultimately going to be a nothing burger um, if you've worked in a nonprofit, you know that occasionally the board will come in and say, why aren't you working on this thing? And sometimes the answer is because it's a stupid thing and it won't go anywhere. Um, we had a I know lot you of... said board, but I heard Borg. I'm sorry. Yes, the Borg. <laughs> you will assimilate to the issues we think you should be working on is actually shockingly accurate. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, so we've had people ask, well, why aren't you working on NFTs? And I was like, no, we're not going to do that. Because um, we don't, and then you have to make the pitch about like I think this is going to flame out and not be a thing. Um, conversely, then all of a sudden, everybody in Washington D.C. had to get very smart about AI very fast mm -hmm. about three or four months ago, um, and it has been a wild process to watch. We had not really worked on AI, but we'd sort of like loosely worked on it. Actually, we put out a paper a, weirdly back in 2018 about AI, um, which we were like, that was cool that we did that anyway. Um, and then ChatGPT dropped, and then everyone was freaking out about AI all the time. Um, and now we have to get good at it, and we have to develop an AI policy. Um, and, you know, and then these lead to com the complicated conversations. Like, you know, I was on the ChatGPT panel on Friday, um, you know, and I pointed this out, that it is very difficult to talk about AI and policy around AI without engaging on labor issues mm -hmm. like that is fundamentally and we're not a labor organization <clears throat> but we came to the realization like we we can't kind of not be a labor organization if we're going to talk about this or at the very least we need to talk to folks who are labor organizations and figure out where we stand on this um, and so yeah it is a constant balancing act um, you know which means it's never boring which is kind of great. Um, but it also means it can be very frustrating. I had one of my colleagues, Harold, has been working on spectrum policy at the FCC for decades at this point. And a thing that he was working on for the business data services, he was working on it for about 15 years. And then the 2016 election happened. And then the new administration just threw the entire thing out the window. And he was like, if anybody needs me, I'm going to be in my office with a bottle of scotch. Uh, and it happens. And it sucks. I mean, we saw the election happen, and then the net neutrality rules got thrown out the window that we'd all spent like a decade or better <laughs> fighting for. You know, and so you have to learn to take the heartbreak with it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, there's no good answer, you know, despite all the talking we just did. Um, you just kind of have to make a judgment call as you roll. And know what you can control <clears throat> and what you can't. And yeah. what to... I mean, which leads into what you can be. We're all Zen up masters on, on one level. <laughs> We're all Zen masters and then very not Zen. Anyway, thank you for coming to a group therapy session. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi. So, to what extent uh, have right to repair laws in other countries and the EU in particular had an impact on the domestic situation? Um, they've been used as models in a lot of cases. So, like France's repairability score has popped up a lot, mm -hmm. um, and it's useful. You know, I think the problem is it occasionally gets thrown at as like, uh, why don't we do this instead of actually doing something substantive, um, which can be a little bit of a distraction. Um, the more interesting ones are the ones that don't come up uh, because they're actually really good. So Australia's right to repair law about 
autos. So Austra- as I had an Australian academic explain it to me, um, Australia does not make cars. Australia fixes cars. They import all of their cars. Um, and so they don't really care about car manufacturers. Uh, they car about, care about car repairmen. And so the way that they framed their law, my understanding is, um, it is an absolute right to repair. And if you are an auto manufacturer and you interfere in the ability of someone to re- of an independent repair shop to fix a car, that is a daily fine that you start racking up for every day that you have impeded their ability to access repair manuals and software and parts. Um, you know, and there are certain obligations about you can you have to make it available under like it's the Australian equivalent of FRAND, fair, reasonable, and non discriminatory. You know, there's standards about it. Um, but they start from the premise of you have a right to fix this. And if you stand in the way of that, then you're going to start having a problem, um, which is buck wild to me as an American. Um, I'm like, what do you mean you start with the consumer? <laughs> this is what? Um, I'm on the upside down, uh, literally, because uh, <laughs> it's Australia. Um, so, yeah, it, it is interesting. It hasn't come up a ton, um, I think, because it. I don't know that there are a lot of global right to repair laws out there right yeah. now. That I'm aware of. I mean, a lot of it is trans- transparency is often the first step when you're thinking about legislation on any issue, and so I think there's a big movement there. But you know. yeah. So I guess what I mean is, um, how much does that impact, or how much does that influence the companies? Ah. Uh. Well, <laughs> not much. If we have Apple to go by, um, yeah. so one of the things that they get dinged for correctly is that, you know, Apple doesn't really like right to repair, obviously, as we've talked about extensively. Um, one of the things that they have done, they do all kinds of stuff specifically for, the like, the weakest point. So, like, the screen is the weakest point of the phone. It's always going to be the first thing to go. Um, and so they started doing this thing where they paired the screen to the phone, and if you tried to repair it with an aftermarket screen, it would break the phone. They have walked that back because, understandably, people got very mad about this. Um, another thing that they started doing, which they got in actual trouble for, um, was the way that they secured the battery in the casing. Um, batteries are usually, the they're in the top five points of failure, usually for phones. Uh, and so you have to replace batteries somewhat often. And uh, Apple said that we don't want people replacing the batteries. And so what we're going to do is that rather than secure the batteries with uh, fixtures, we are going to glue the battery into the phone. Which seems annoying until you realize that trying to rip it out from the glue could rupture the battery, which could cause a fire or an explosion. Um, People could lose their hands or their lives uh, for doing this. So it was a major safety hazard. And they got, you know, basically when this came out, it took a little bit of time to build up steam, but they got appropriately raked over the coals. They haven't stopped doing it, however, as far as I'm aware. Um, And so this is all out there. This was part of the discussion around France's repairability score law, and it hasn't changed the company behavior regardless. So, you know, America's still the biggest market for a lot of these companies. And I think until we see movement here, everything else is going to largely be around the margins. Yeah. I apologize. This shifts slightly, so tell me to sit down if need be. But with the if you buy it, you own it concept, not really repair per se, has there ever been a discussion of like on Amazon, if you buy a Kindle book, you don't own it. You're oh. renting it. And they could take it away from you whenever they want. Because I've, I've lost books. I've known other people that have as well. So, or Meredith has a- no opinions on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm checking sorry. how much time we have. You've activated my trap card. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about this. I'm sure we have opinions. Is there any movement with that, I guess? Yes. Would be my question. I don't think there's a panel after this one. You keep going. <laughs> you shouldn't have told me that. <laughs> There's a um, panel at 10, and I haven't eaten dinner, okay? <laughs> yeah, we're going to get dinner. That's the panel. Um, there's a panel of food. Uh, no, so, okay, yeah, the, the short version is yes, this has been a debate that has been going on for a very long time. Um, right now, for folks who uh, are following along at home, um, basically, when you buy anything that is fundamentally software, which includes ebooks. Uh, when you buy, and I'm going to use scare quotes around here, um, <laughs> there are actually academics who have written how uh, entirely about how the buy now button on Amazon is bullshit. Um, sensor bar bleep over my mouth for that one. Uh, we'll do that in post. Um, I it, <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, so, so basically when you are purchasing access to a digital good, 
you are purchasing access to the digital good. You're not buying the good. Buying has a legal understanding. It's also got a common sense understanding. If you buy a thing, you can do all kinds of funky stuff with it because you own it. It is your stuff. Um, when you're buying a digital good, you are paying the proprietor of the digital good for the right to access that digital good so long as it remains on their server. So Netflix is like the most salient example of this for a lot of folks. Netflix shifts out their library all the time. You are not buying anything on Netflix. You are merely paying for the right to access it. Uh, Amazon Prime Video, same thing, even worse, arguably, because there's a buy button. So you pay $19.99 to, to buy the Matrix, and then whoops, all of a sudden it's gone. They don't care that you paid $19.99. It's not in their library. You don't get to watch it anymore. Um, ebooks, in particular, I will not go on my full ebook rant. Um, ebooks are uh, unique in that they are screwing over libraries really badly right now. Uh, libraries don't get to purchase ebooks. Libraries get to pay to subscribe to a platform like an OverDrive, um, which is basically a Netflix for books. In addition to paying for that, they then pay for each individual copy uh, of the ebook that they can lend out. Each of those copies. They can lend out a set number of times, which is usually either 50 loans or two years, at which point the files self-destruct. And then they have to pay for it again. And they do this at a price which is approximately 400% over retail for what consumers pay. And the platforms and the publishers get to mine all that data from you. And it's they get the money. It's a scam. Um, it's ludicrous. <laughs> Uh, and so there is a lot of pushback within libraries. And libraries, like they don't have anything else to worry about right now, um, have their budgets are being slashed. And more and more and more of their budgets are being diverted away from other programmatic stuff, which we ask libraries to do a lot. They provide internet access for local communities where there isn't reliable internet access. They provide all kinds of social services to folks. They provide job hunting services. They provide literacy resources unbelievable the works that libraries do um, and more and more of their budget is getting diverted to paying for ebooks that then self-destruct then they have to buy again um, it's a total racket um, so this is where things like the internet archive come in and their ebook lending program which was the subject of just a little lawsuit that you may have heard of um, and so yeah so the the to back up from my rant before i go all the way down the highway um, yes there is a lot of pushback on this because i think folks are now coming to realize that buying something doesn't mean what we all think that it means. Um, and the idea of digital first sale is the, the legal term for it, about like once you buy a file, I should be able to resell my ebooks to Haley. Like I can resell my paperbacks to her. Why can't I loan my ebook to her? Why can't I resell my ebook to her? Um, so this is a discussion that is happening. It gets into weirder, even murkier areas of copyright law right. than what we just spent an hour talking about. So that'll give you some scale. Um, but it is, a, it is a discussion that's happening. Advocates have been pushing for this like since like the oh. early 2000s. Yeah. So, thank you. That's a very long way of saying I, yes. I will just also add the, the way that I've seen this come up too in some discussions is, um, you know, like when my grandfather passed away, I could get some of his books, but mm -hmm. I, all of them, a lot of my books are, you know, uh, not physical books. So um, the question of like legacy and estate and mm -hmm. which gets into a whole other area of law, but um, that's another way that I've seen this yep. conversation come up a lot. So I know we're at time, and I'm not going to risk pissing off um, the god of the EFF track, also known as Scott, who's sitting in the front row here. Um, sure. Okay. okay. This is not a good question to end on, I don't think. But right. it does kind of go a little bit more abstract than, um, than the one that was just asked. Um, I'm curious. You, you've mentioned a couple of times how, how big is the universe for Right to Repair? Where does it start? And I'm kind of curious if you feel whether the EFF actually has – it's the same wheelhouse for – bodily autonomy in terms of genetic things like protein uh, folding and all these things that are now becoming really way more accessible than they've ever been before due to AI, due to quantum computing, when we can actually do it and it goes into math and what it sounds like to me you were describing earlier is des design type mm -hmm. uh, patenting. And I know that biopharmaceutical companies have been doing that with uh, nonsense mutations and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So does that fall underneath the FF? 
It seems like maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Haley does it. I mean, that is such a good question. That's like, can I think about it for a year and then have a panel next year? <laughs> as long as you don't get sick and need right, medicine that right, you right, can't right. have because... So yeah, one, one of the reasons I'm, I'm asking also is because I know for something like... Um, um, oh, I cannot remember what it's called. There, There is a... Uh, be the match the company Mm -hmm. where you can donate um bone marrow Mm -hmm. when you do that in in the in the same way that um a new drug in pharmaceuticals would be the investigational product Mm -hmm. you are each person who who does the donation and has an hla antigen that matches with the, the donor or who they're going to donate to mm-hmm. you become the investigational product your dna hmm. Hmm. so if that's the same kind of template that they would be using for something with protein folding or, or any, anything like that then that's going to be a per person mm-hmm. type of thing yeah no it's it is interesting i will say um by so like biopharma biological patenting dna patenting is a thing um that's about the extent of my knowledge um yeah no it's a thing and there are active debates around this about um this actually again it comes up sort of in at least two buckets that i am aware of and can sort of very vaguely speak to one is the like you know can you patent a genome that occurs in nature um which happening in the human body which yeah a lot of people have that exact reaction of "Mm." Um, the other thing that comes up is, um, patenting of genetic, uh, genetically modified organisms. And that actually, I can speak a little bit more to that because that has become a big trade issue, international trade mm-hmm. issue. Um, because, uh, Monsanto, uh, <laughs> did you plant this. people in this audience? I did not. It's like a soundboard. I just have to say Monsanto and that gets the boo effect. Um, Hey! I'll take it. Um, yeah, so one of the things that happens with GMOs is, um, this is to, to abbreviate wildly, mostly because patents make my brain melt, which again, take that as a point of reference. Um, <laughs> genetically modified organisms and GMOs, to use it in the sense of like things that Monsanto cranks out, there's a lot of debate about what constitutes a GMO and what does not. The stuff that Monsanto cranks out, GMOs, um, are engineered in such a way that they are like you know there are a lot of like really incredible things that these crops can do in terms of production in terms of yield in terms of disease resistance um has been a huge boon in a lot of ways especially to the developing world and the global south um and uh india is like one of the big um recipients like one of the big export destinations for for Mon- especially monsanto as they are really the biggest game in town um for a lot of these genetically modified crops um these genetically modified crops, however, uh, usually cannot reproduce. So the seeds that they drop are sterile, if they drop seeds at all. The idea is they want the farmers to keep coming back and buying the seeds from Monsanto year after year. Because of the biopatents on these things, if the seed blows into a neighbor's field and starts growing there just by the wind, um, that neighbor farmer can now be liable for patent infringement because this genetically modified organism started growing like, without their consent, just does what plants do. It flew into the next yard and started growing there. Um, this is a very, very big international global trade problem, um, to put it mildly. There's a lot of tension around it. Um, and, you know, and I think I can't speak in any detail to the way that this has played out like on a policy level in the United States, but it is an active topic of debate about what what are the kind of boundaries we want to put around again a patent system which was designed to protect you know improvements in threshers for fields you know a a better a better like the cotton gin um you know a better method for making peanut butter you know all these kinds of stuff that we think about as inventions widgets stuff that do things and now all of a sudden we are using it to patent biological processes or dna or or what have you um i do know that is a very robust debate i have some colleagues who god bless them wade into it um i do not and that is a choice (laughs) yeah i think i mean 
<laughs> Meredith does not work for EFF, so I guess I should answer your question. Uh, you know, we, it's not something we've thought about yet. I mean, I think you're ahead of the policy discussion in, in a lot of ways, but I do think it's coming, right? We're thinking a lot about genetic privacy. We're thinking a lot about health data privacy um, and, and bodily autonomy on those lines. We're, you know, in the even in the right to repair context, you know, prosthetics, right? Like mm -hmm. being able to repair. So I think you're, you're ahead of the curve, but it's something that we'll probably have to think about. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't have an answer for you yet. Okay. We will eventually have to have a position on the torment nexus, <laughs> which is like 90% of tech policy at this point. <laughs> Someone invented the torment nexus. How do we regulate it? All right. We are eight minutes over. Thank you, Scott. Um,